A surprise Japanese attack on the U.S. Pacific Fleet at anchor at Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, dragged the United States into a world war which had begun in 1939. Mushroom-shaped clouds from two atomic bombs on Japanese targets brought an end to the worst war in world history 75 years ago in August 1945. In between those two historical markers, over 50 million Americans would don U.S. uniforms and do battle with the Axis forces. Over 400,000 Americans would be killed or lost in action, and many more wounded or injured. For this generation, the war was not the first catastrophe they had faced. For more than a decade, they were growing up in the midst of the Great Depression. They rightly earned the title the greatest generation as they fought their way from Africa to Italy to Normandy's beaches. From the bulge to Remagen's bridges, they fought their way mile after mile on into the heart of the Third Reich. In the Pacific, Americans would carry the battle to the Japanese in the wild jungles and mountains of New Guinea and on to the island hopping campaigns of the U.S. Marines as they fought from Guadalcanal to Saipan to Tarawa and on to Iwo Jima. 60 million people had died in that war, most of them civilians caught in the middle of the clashes of great armies and great violence. Much of Europe, especially Germany, lay in utter ruins, as did the firebomb cities of Japan. The United States would turn to helping rebuild much of what it had destroyed via the Marshall Plan created by President Truman. American occupation forces restored order and governed in Europe and Japan. Truman was determined to restore the economies of our former enemies and restore them to the family of nations. The Americans wanted no repeat of the failures that attended the treaties that ended World War I and sowed the seeds of World War II. Fifteen million Americans in uniform were desperate to get out of those clothes and get back to civilian lives that had been on hold for four long years. Congress approved and financed a GI Bill that would send many of them back to colleges and universities to build a foundation for those new lives. That same bill would finance new homes for the veterans and their baby boomer children who were born in droves in the immediate post-war years. America got busy housing and educating and employing the millions of veterans who proudly wore the ruptured duck discharge lapel pin on their suits. If you didn't wear that pin, you couldn't get elected dog catcher in any town in the USA. The veterans and their needs and their contributions fueled an economic boom in the 1950s, and one of their own, General Dwight D. Eisenhower, would lead the country into that boom as president. By 1950, war would break out again, this time on the distant Korean Peninsula. It would feature Soviet and Chinese backed North Korean forces attacking South Korean troops and U.S. occupation troops. War-weary American veterans in the reserve forces were called back on active duty and shipped to fight in Korea. They fought under a United Nations flag, and in three years of bitter fighting, this war would sputter into an uneasy truce along the same border where it began. Dwight Eisenhower would hand over the White House to a younger World War II veteran, P.T. Boat Skipper John F. Kennedy, in the 1960 election. Upon Kennedy's death by an assassin's bullet, yet another World War II veteran, Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson, would take over as president and slowly be dragged into yet another regional war in South Vietnam. 
the first wave of American troops dispatched to fight in Vietnam in 1965 included professional soldiers who were now fighting their third war, World War II, Korea, now Vietnam. This war would drag on for 10 long years and involve 3 million U.S. troops and four U.S. presidents. World War II veterans have made and witnessed history over nearly a century. Now in their 90s, their numbers have dwindled to a precious few. Their stories have been told in books and movies and oral history interviews. Their days of glory are enshrined in the granite of the World War II Memorial on the Mall in the nation's capital. Now we are come to this year's Virginia International Tattoo to mark 75 years since the end of World War II. We come to salute and honor the, those few old veterans still standing among us and to mourn all those who have left us too soon. The greatest generation saved the world from a deadly darkness and helped to rebuild that shattered world for a deserved peace. For decades, they governed our towns and cities, our states and our nation. They built businesses and industries and manned the jobs in what they built. They moved the United States from a quiet, isolated backwater to its position as the strongest nation in the world. They were the best men and women we had. We owe them our thanks. We owe them a heartfelt salute. We gather to bid them a fond farewell as the last of them accept our salute. God bless them all. In the words of that old British World War II song, we'll meet again, don't know where, don't know when.